It is a great pleasure to be here today and to have uh, a lot of honored guests. We have the president of the university, President Stanley. It's always great to have you here. And our wonderful provost, and we have our honored guests, Randy Cowan. Thank you, Randy. And Eleanor Cowan. And of course, we have our Cowan chairs that we'll be hearing more from a little later. So with that, I want to hand the floor over to President Stanley and, and welcome him to make a few remarks. So even though my font is gigantic on the sheet, I'm still going to put my glasses on just from a habit. So, um, so, so thank you so much, Dean Duxbury, and good afternoon. And thank all of you for joining us on this grand occasion for the Department of Physics and Astronomy, the College of Natural Science, and of course, the entire university community. We're here today to honor the newest recipients of the Jerry Cowan Endowed Chair of Experimental Physics, Assistant Professors Jonas Becker and Tyler Cocker, who we hear from later in the program. And I very much look forward to this. I had a chance to talk to Jonas a little bit about his work, but I look forward to hearing much more about it. We actually had an event last night where, for endowed professorships and distinguished professors at MSU, and so I had a chance to meet him then. He wasn't officially installed then, so maybe I shouldn't have been talking to him. I hadn't realized that, but I didn't let that stop us. Um, so anyway, congratulations to you both, and I'm really looking forward, as I said, to hearing more about your research. We're also here to recognize the generosity and vision of Jerry Cowan's son, Randy. Randy established his endowed faculty position in memory of his father's life and physics career at Michigan State University. Randy, thank you so very much for your support and for everything you do for MSU. Private philanthropy and endowed positions are absolutely critical to supporting excellence in research and teaching. And indeed, they sharpen our competitiveness and allow us to recruit the best and brightest of our faculty. And as I mentioned, I was reminded of the reception we had yesterday for our endowed chairs and university distinguished professors. And I'm reminded of it again today by the distinguished colleagues gathered here. Such endowments are also crucial to achieve many of our university's strategic goals. Those goals include reaching $1 billion in research expenditures annually, further solidifying MSU's place among the world's great universities. My thanks to all who support our excellence in discovery, creativity, and innovation. And my congratulations again to you, Dr. Becker and Dr. Cocker, on your remarkable achievements and this honor. You will become valuable assets to our university and the world we serve. And with that, I'll turn the program over to our provost, Dr. Teresa Woodruff, for her remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Stanley. And I'm also delighted to be here today to recognize and congratulate Dr. Jonas Becker and Dr. Tyler Coker on their installations as the Jerry Cowan Endowed Chairs of Experimental Physics. It really is heartening to resume these kinds of investiture events after two years uh, due to the pandemic. And so we're really delighted just to be uh, embodied here uh, today. I also want to take the opportunity to thank Randy and his family for your generosity uh, in endowing uh, this uh, chair position and really to honor your father who earned his PhD here in physics and then joined our physics faculty for a great number of years. Uh, thank you for recognizing him and the enduring excellence that uh, he has inspired. Um, each of our faculty within this department, many of whom are joining us today, make an enormous impact on the university, the state, and our world uh, through their research, teaching, and outreach. Uh, and it's really uh, an exciting opportunity for all of us to celebrate you as well. We also want to thank Dean Duxbury, a physicist himself, uh, for his leadership of the College of Natural Science. Uh, and thank you. I think we should just call this Physics Fest, I think, after all of that <laughs> physics that we're all uh, here about. But today's investiture uh, really does underscore the importance of endowed funds and endowed faculty members of the university. And I should note that we are playing uh, a little bit of catch up with Dr. Coker, who joined us in 2018. And he has already proven several times over through his research accomplishments in ultra fast physics, how fortunate we really are to have successfully recruited him to Michigan State University. And Dr. Becker joined us uh, at MSU in December of 2021 and has hit the ground running, developing and readying his lab to conduct groundbreaking research in solid state quantum optics. I'm confident that Dr. Becker and Dr. Coker will continue making significant contribution in their fields 
and that they will play strong leadership roles at this institution, both as faculty members and as mentors to the next generation of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. So now directly to Drs. Becker and Coker, and before the medal ceremony, I want to give you a charge, and it is this that endowed professorships are among the highest honors a university bestows. They are given in recognition of the work that has been done and with great expectation of the work that is yet to come. And so I charge you to not sit in your endowed chairs, <laughs> but to be stirred to new levels of creativity. Be untethered from conventional thinking and create impact that benefits the nature of an endowed chair and our investment and trust in you and your work. I feel like I should stop and say, I do, or something like that. <laughs> and now I have a charge for all of us in the room. The community that joins together in this investiture, we, all of us, act as proxy for the university writ large as we install Drs. Becker and Coker as the Jerry Cohen Endowed Chairs in Experimental Physics. We too must hold to the principles of excellence that really all are, are the hallmark of a great university. It is really in that resonance that this university will continue to rise. And so today we celebrate, we uh, gather together and we celebrate, uh, we celebrate history, heritage, your father would be proud of you, and we indeed are proud of the two members of our community that we install today. And so with that, I turn the program over to our fantastic Dean of the College of Natural Sciences, Dean Phil Duxbury. Thank you, Provost Woodruff, and thank you, President Stanley. It, uh, it, this is a real celebration. It's, a, it's just wonderful to have so many physicists in one place at the same time. In person, that, that is really great. Uh, the generosity of the Cowan family has been transformative for the physics department, in particular the field that I am, uh, that, that I work in, condensed matter physics. And over the last seven or eight years, it has become much, much stronger doing things we couldn't have done any other way. So it's, it's a, a, a great honor to say thank you very much for making that transformation. <laughs> President Stanley has been a great addition to this university. I, I, I feel it's been transformative for us, and so it's great to say thank you to him and to Provost Woodruff for really making a change here. So another important reason for today's ceremony is to recognize and thank Randy Cowan and his family for establishing these endowed positions in recognition and the life and career of his father, Jerry Cowan. Jerry was an outstanding researcher in material science and a noted instructor, particularly at the undergraduate level. <clears throat> his research at Michigan State spanned five decades, and I was a colleague of his for 35 years, something like that, and I always enjoyed his presence Jerry was a person that had a lot of insight and he didn't think the same way as many people in the department. So he always came up with interesting new thoughts about almost any topic that we discussed. Uh, he had many international collaborations and many significant research results and he was always changing fields too. He was looking for new materials, he was looking for new ideas, he was an innovative guy. He was inspiring and passionate about his work um, and is the model for our Cowan chairs. So we can tell you more about what he was like and you, you can <laughs> stay with that. Um, on behalf of the college, thanks to you and your family for your vision, Randy, and generosity in endowing these three positions and for your support of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. As Provost Woodruff mentioned, endowments are the hallmark of a great university. These funds are an extraordinary and special resource for Michigan State University and the department. To excel in our missions of research and education, we now need outstanding faculty. We need to recruit them and we need to retain them. And endowments allow us to do that and to compete nationally. There are many places competing for people of the caliber of our Cowan Chairs. The Jerry Cowan Endowed Chair in Experimental Physics helps us guarantee that Michigan State University will maintain its worldwide reputation as a leader in experimental condensed matter physics. 
Mentoring from top level scientists such as Tyler and Jonas will also ensure that our students and trainees have research opportunities that are among the best in the world. Tyler and Jonas, we're looking forward to great things. With that, I will turn the program over to Physics and Astronomy Department Chair, Steve Zeff, who will make a few remarks on behalf of the department and introduce our two Cowan Chair recipients. Thank you, Phil. And of course, this sort of just continues the physics fest aspect. But um, uh, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, as everyone said, it's really great to have these investitures in person, to see everybody together, and to celebrate the successes. I mean, Phil already said it, but I'm going to say it again because it's really true. Um, it's the generosity of Randy Cowan and his family. We now have a strong history of successful Jerry Cowan endowed chairs who were able to recruit here. Uh, because we had these positions, we're just not getting people like this randomly, as, as Phil said, it's very competitive. Um, so one of the things I wanted to acknowledge is that we actually have a couple of our first Cowan chairs, I believe they're here, uh, Matt Comstock and Johannes Polinen. Um, so they're here to help us celebrate, and there's Matt and Johannes somewhere. And it really is a, a line of, of success. Uh, it, it, they, they were all experimental kinetic matter physicists, so they work in the basement of BPS, and it's just a, it's an exciting place to be now, um, and it really, the, it's these chairs that have really made this possible. Um, so we're recognizing the two Cowan and Dow chairs in experimental physics today. Experimental kinetic matter physics is a highly competitive field. To make an impact, you really need cutting-edge facilities, and of course, cutting-edge facilities equals money. So they don't come cheap, but the payoff is big, uh, you get new discoveries in areas like single molecule measurements and biophysics, quantum information science, ultra-fast physics, new quantum devices. Um, and we'll hear more about these from the people actually doing it, of course, that's why I'm up here to introduce them. So first, we're going to introduce Jonas. Uh, uh, so I'm going to share a few words of introduction about Jonas Becker on behalf of the department before he gives us the overview of his work. Um, Jonas received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Sutherland University in Germany and his PhD in physics from the same university in 2017. From there, he went to the University of Oxford as a postdoctoral researcher, and then to Imperial College London as a research associate in quantum information. Recruited him here, and there were some COVID-related visa delays along the way, but as we noted before, he arrived uh, this past December, and although his physical arrival was delayed by COVID, uh, he was already working throughout the fall planning his new lab, and the renovation of his lab space is in full swing right now. If you walked over there, you'd probably find somebody working in the basement or sub-basement on it. Uh, Jonas's research area is formally called solid state quantum optics. A key goal of his group's work is to create optical devices for applications in quantum information processing. One way to think about this is every time there's another story about some breakthrough in quantum computing and how quantum computing will revolutionize a new area of science, Underlying this are devices that enable this quantum information processing. There's a wealth of physics along with connections, engineering, and discovery and development. Uh, devices enable all this quantum information science that makes the news. Uh, with all the attention and major funding initiatives around quantum science, it's a highly competitive environment to hire excellent people and build the labs they need to be successful. We're excited to have Dr. Becker here at MSU and grateful for the support of the Cowan Endowed Chair to provide the resources to enable him and us to be leaders in this active field. So with that, I'll turn things over to Jonas, who can uh, tell us about all the great things he's doing in solid state quantum optics. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. And yeah, thank you all for being here, really. So yeah, I want to give you a very brief overview over the research we're doing in, in my group, the solid state quantum optics group. Um, and when I was preparing these slides, I was, I was reminded of this quote here by, by Yoda in Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, and I hope, I, I actually disagree with this quote a little bit, and I hope that over the next couple of minutes, I can convince you that we can really accomplish um, astonishing things if light and matter actually work together. So in my group, we're interested in the properties and the interactions of light and matter on a quantum level. So the interactions of single particles of light, photons, with single atoms or defects in a variety of solid state systems, really. 
Um, and on the one hand, we want to use light to control the state of, of atoms or defects. But on the other hand, we also want to use these matter-based systems, these atoms, to really control the properties of light and even, even go one step further and use these matter-based systems to mediate interactions between multiple particles of light to make them do things light would normally not do. Um, and what are those things? Well, they can actually be illustrated quite well by, by this um, picture here um, of, of these two gentlemen um, settling a, <laughs> uh, a galactic dispute um, with, a, with a, a lightsaber duel. And the lightsaber is really a, a remarkable science fiction item, if you think about it, because somehow they managed to stop a beam of light right there <laughs> in midair. And also, these two beams or, or blades bounce off of each other which is obviously in stark contrast to, to what we are used to in, in everyday life. My, my laser pointer here can in fact reach the screen and it also doesn't interact with the photons coming from this projector here, for example. Which is probably good, because otherwise I would probably create a huge mess by pointing at things, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, these are exactly the two things that we want our uh, photons to do in the lab, kind of. So how do we do this in the lab? Well. We have these, these special crystals here, um, and in, in our lab, we typically have them mounted to a cryostat because we have to perform our experiments at, at very low temperatures. Um, and these crystals can be made out of a variety of materials. Um, a system we work with a lot is synthetic diamond, which, as you might know, in its pure form, only contains carbon and is highly transparent. But other elements, like silicon or nitrogen, can either replace carbon atoms in, in the crystal lattice, or they can form more, more complex defects, like for example, an atom sitting in between two missing carbon atoms. And these crystal defects strongly interact with light and are in fact what gives um, some natural diamonds their color. Um, and these are the quantum systems that we use to really control our single photons in the lab. Um, so how do we do this? Well, um, we can, for example, send a single photon into this crystal together with another, in this case, strong control pulse. So this is a, a light pulse that contains many photons at a slightly different wavelength compared to the single photon. And in fact, they are both at very specific wavelengths with respect to the internal energy level structure of our atoms or defects in this crystal. And in this special configuration here, our single photon is then mapped into a coherent uh, excitation of these, these um, defects in the crystal. And we call this a spin wave. And, and um, coherent in this case means that the quantum state this photon was in is actually preserved and is now encoded in this excitation of the crystal. And then the cool thing is, um, if we send in a second control pulse, we can actually convert this excitation back into the original photon in its original quantum state, and it just continues its journey. So we've effectively stopped a photon in this crystal and then released it again on demand. So what we've effectively built here is an optical quantum memory. Um, you know, very similar to a memory in a classical computer, but in this case for, for a um, quantum state. So this is stopping light. Um, what about making it interact with other light? Um, interestingly, if we send a second photon through this memory without a control pulse, but while there is already a photon stored in the memory, then this photon will actually um, change the, this excitation ever so slightly. And if we then read this original photon out of the memory and compare its properties, um, with, with the properties before it got read into the memory, then we see that they are now not identical anymore. Now, they don't quite bounce off of each other, but um, they acquire a phase shift. It's a very minute change, but it's enough for us to um, then, for example, conditionally route them um, down a separate beam path just using passive optical elements. So what is all of this useful for? Um, certainly not building lightsabers, 
but building quantum computers, which you've probably heard of at this point because they've been all over the news over the past couple of years, including these gems of headlines here. Um, now, in the classical computer, information is encoded in bits, um, which can take on two states, zero and one. Um, the, the building block of a quantum computer is the quantum bit or qubit, which can also take on these two states, zero and one, but in addition to that, also arbitrary superpositions of zero and one, which we typically um, illustrate by these spheres. And then in addition to that, two qubits can also be entangled with each other, which means that they are in a correlated state where a measurement on one qubit determines the state of the other. And these two properties are, are the properties that we can really use to tackle a number of computational problems with quantum computers that cannot be efficiently solved on classical machines. The problem is that these quantum bits themselves need to be single quantum systems, which we need to be able to control precisely, and which should also not be perturbed by interactions with their environment, for example, too easily. And it turns out that photons are actually really good qubits in principle, because they do not interact with anything, even, even under ambient conditions. And we can encode quantum information in photons in many, many different ways. The problem is um, we can only really create them somewhat probabilistically, and they don't interact with anything, including other photons. So realizing logic gates between photons is actually very difficult. But our quantum memories can now actually solve all of these issues. So we can use our quantum memories to synchronize probabilistically created photons with each other, and then also use these memories to mediate interactions between these photons to actually perform um, purely optical quantum computation, and then also store the result of this computation in a quantum output buffer. And this research really relies on a very close collaboration between um, the materials development, because we need these special crystals, and the quantum optics side. And this is why we joined forces with Shannon Nicely's group um, in, in the ECE department here, who's currently setting up a a diamond and quantum materials group. Um, and uh, we, we have shared lab facilities and meetings, etc. And we, we sort of united our efforts under this um, joint umbrella of, of the Quantum Optical Devices Laboratory. So we are currently setting up a state-of-the-art quantum optics lab in, in the basement of the BPS. And Shannon is also building, for example, this chemical vapor deposition system for uh, diamond quantum quantum materials growth. Not only that, and, and we are, we're, you know, we're starting to see first results on both the materials development side and the, the um, device fabrication side, sort of in preparation for first optical experiments, hopefully in a couple of weeks from now. So the lab is in a pretty good state already. Um, not only that, we also have the Fraunhofer USA Center Midwest um, Division for Coatings and Diamond Technologies on campus. And they have even more diamond growth, fabrication, and characterization capabilities on campus. And Shannon and I are both affiliated with the center as well. So I really don't think I'm exaggerating if I say that we've created a really unique environment and infrastructure here to do this kind of research. And I think it's, it's pretty unique, not just in the US, but, but probably worldwide. And none of this would have been possible without the generous support by MSU and Fraunhofer, of course, but especially it would not have been possible without um, the support by, by you, Randy, and the Cowan family. And we're incredibly grateful for, for the support and grateful for the opportunities this now really opens up. And then last but not least, none of this would be possible without the people who actually do the work, our <laughs> students. And, and even though both of our groups are still young, we've already been able to assemble an amazing team of students, and we're really looking forward to, to working with them over the next couple of years. Thank you.
hello again. So um, thank you, Jonas, for a great presentation. And I'm not going to repeat everything I said before about how important the Kalamazoo Dow chairs have been for building a thriving community of uh, successful uh, experimental condensed matter physicists. But I really mean it. it it's uh, it's really wonderful to see all the and hear about all the great things going on in the labs in the basement of our building. Uh, so now we'll go on and uh, introduce uh, Tyler Cocker. Uh, so Tyler received his bachelor's degree uh, in physics from University of Victoria in Canada and his PhD in experimental condensed matter physics from University of Alberta in 2012. He then went to the University of Regensburg in Germany where he's a postdoctoral researcher, a Humboldt fellow, and then a group leader. We successfully recruited him to Michigan State and he joined us in January of 2018. Uh, Tyler's research area can be broadly described as ultra-fast physics. Uh, more specifically, combines femtosecond terahertz technology with scanning tunneling microscopy. That's obviously a mouthful. So the <laughs> technique is normally called THZ or terahertz STM. Um, and this was really invented in Tyler's research uh, with Frank Hegeman in Alberta. Tyler then went to Re Regensburg, Germany, where it's location one of the other major groups uh, in ultrafast physics. And there he and his colleagues uh, succeeded in bringing the terahertz and the STM together and bringing it to the atomic scale at, at that point. So upon his arrival at MSU in 2018, uh, Tyler set out to build a new upgraded uh, terahertz STM instrument in his own lab. With the support of the Cowan Endowment, Tyler and his team have been wonderfully successful constructing this complex system. He was showing it off uh, this afternoon, uh, getting it up and running. Um, and really in this field, the, the, the complexity of these things, the fact they're already cranking out results is, is very impressive. Uh, this involves a combination of building a state-of-the-art lab uh, and associated hardware. And also, as you know, said, you need the people and it's really assembled a top-notch team of students and postdocs. Uh, Tyler and his group have recently published their first paper from the lab in Nature Communications. And this work he'll describe more it sets the stage for ultra-fast measurements of, of all sorts of quantum type thing, wave function dynamics and atomically precise nanostructures, um, future ele optoelectronic devices based on uh, tailoring local electronic properties. Uh, sort of basically cool new physics with lots of implications for quantum physics, molecular electronics, and nanotech. So unsurprisingly, uh, Dr. Cochran's team have already won awards for their work. One example is uh, Spencer Emmerman, one of the grad students, won the 2020 award from the is it the terror, uh, Microwave Terahertz uh, National Organization, 2000, uh, 2000 entries. He won the, the Best Student Presentation Award. Uh, Tyler won the Young Scientist of the Year Award from the same organization last year. Um, he also has a Young Investigator Award from ARO, among others. Uh, we're really proud of all the great successes he's had. And with that, well, and Tyler, come up here and tell us about your work. Hi. <laughs> so, um, it's the right button. Oh, press it twice. So, I guess first of all, I'm feeling quite humbled by everybody being here. I really appreciate the attendance, especially from our um, distinguished guests, President, Provost, and especially Randy. Um, you know, as as um, as Dean Duxbury said, I've already been here for a little bit, um, and so what I would like to tell you is give you a little flavor about. Of course, my research, but of course, it's going to be focused on physics. I just have a short 50 or 60 slides or so, <laughs> for, uh, some equations, but don't worry, you'll love it by the end. So. Okay, so this picture is kind of gives you a flavor for it, but let's, let's get into some details. So at the bottom, the first thing we're going to learn is the electromagnetic spectrum. So I think a lot of people know this already. We're a room full of many physicists, but anyways. Down at the low frequency end, so long wavelength is where you have microwaves. Even further would be like radio waves, right? This is, this is good for cooking hot dogs and burritos. It's also good for your phone, but it's, it's basically the kind of thing you can generate with electronics, right? If you were to go to the other end of the spectrum, here we have visible. This is what we can actually see, kind of color-coded. Here we can generate this with technology called photonics. So that's like a laser, right? So, I can make strong, what you would call coherent waves, so not like just from the sun, um, using lasers in this region or microwaves in this region. And for a long time, this region was called the terahertz gap because it was frustratingly inaccessible by either direction. 
there's no longer a terahertz gap. We can now kind of span this whole range. And the thing that allowed us to do this was to use ultra-fast lasers to convert photons from this energy into photons from this energy. So this is now something we can explore, and especially condensed matter physicists are very excited about this, because in this frequency range, the terahertz range, we have all sort of what we would call, what I would call low energy elementary excitations, but what one astronomer I know calls wiggles and jiggles. <laughs> so these are basically important excitations in condensed matter systems, that is materials, solid state materials, you have all these sort of things shaking about. And they're important because they can actually really tell you about how something functions, especially if you start talking about nanotechnology and really reduce dimensions. These things can become critical to really tell you, how is this thing going to work? How could I use it as a device? Oops, click twice again. So I use terahertz radiation to study materials. I started my PhD just focusing the terahertz radiation down. But you might have heard this limitation that if you focus light down, you can't just focus it down to the size of an atom. How far you can focus it depends on what is the wavelength. And the wavelength of terahertz is very long, right? So we're only on the macroscopic scale. It's like the size of my fingernail. That's about as big as I can make it. So now there are techniques where you can get smaller and smaller spatial resolution. And the trick is to basically put a needle in front, like a lightning rod or like a fork in a microwave to get a stronger terahertz field at the end and use that to see something much smaller. Now at the end of this, you know, my drawing is supposed to imply the best, um, <laughs> we have ter terahertz scanning tunneling microscopy. In this case, the terahertz pulse comes in, it can be imagined like a voltage and it moves electrons between the sample and an atomically sharp tip. And by doing this, the terahertz can control a current that you can measure and you can take an image that has atomic resolution. You can see a single atom, but not only that, because the pulse is so fast, you can now take snapshots and really make movies out of this. So this opens up a whole new re regime, not just ultra small, but also ultra fast. So see things on there at both in intrinsic length and time scales. So I, when I'm at conferences, I try to say this like very uh, humbly, but I'm going to say it maybe more directly. So Vidrangelic, who's in the audience there, and me in Frank Hegman's group, we invented this technique. So during my PhD, this was the three of us working together. I know it's hard to believe, but this is me. <laughs> <laughs> this is Vidrin. Um, and we'll, we'll loop back around to the fact that Vidrin is the audience in, in a couple minutes. So this was at the University of Alberta in Canada. This Randy, you might notice, does not look quite as sophisticated as what I showed you in the basement. There's very little tape holding down electronics at MSU, for example. Okay. So that was Mark 1. The next ones, Vidra and I then separately, me at the University of Regensburg in Germany, we built an ultra-high vacuum version of this. Basically, imagine doing these experiments in a chamber that thinks that the inside is outer space. And this is now going to be at liquid helium temperature. So we really go to these extremes. And we showed that we could take snapshot images of the electron density around a single molecule. So here is a molecule. You have the electrons. They arrange themselves in sort of this spooky quantum-y way. And you can actually take a picture of what that looks like. Not only that, you can kick the molecule and watch it move up and down with this technique. Because remember, you can see the motion now. Meanwhile, at the University of Alberta, Vedran took over from what I had been doing and really vastly improved it, making this now an ultra-high vacuum instrument showing that Terrets STM could show single atoms. Okay, I'll show you one more thing about this because I've been talking about movies and stuff. So this was a, a picture we took in Regensburg of one molecule. This is sort of where the atoms are, and this is the Terrets STM image. But of course, you can kick this thing and make it move. So you can really take something akin to a molecular movie. Right? So people are getting very excited about this. Here's, for example, a little news story. <laughs> I didn't make this picture, but someone did, so I can use it. OK, so now we're on to MSU, starting at Michigan State University. And so I started in 2018. First, we had the destruction phase, where we <laughs> broke the room. And then I would have to say that the renovations were very impressively 
done, you can see from May to August, already we have this beautiful room that's been designed to be really, I would say for the first time, optimized to do Terrett's STM. Not just an ultra fast lab housing it or an STM lab, but really this is for Terrett's STM. You can see here our build up phase. So in one year to August 2019 and then February 2020, we have a working optical setup and an STM. Okay, now I'm going to kind of loop back around to something I mentioned. So, and also, I guess, sort of to reinforce what Jonas said, I mean, the key is really the people in the lab who are doing the work. And it's, that's kind of the most important thing. To recruit really a great team, that's what allows you to build these sort of instruments. So Spencer Ommerman, who you see here, was my first PhD student, joined on already while I was sort of in Germany on my way coming here. Spencer's going to graduate soon with really a wonderful PhD and has designed this great optical setup. Meanwhile, Vidrin, you might think, what is this guy doing in MSU? I thought he was in Alberta. So through the Cowan endowment, we actually had the available funds to recruit Vidrin as a postdoc for two years and pay him to help us set up this Terrets STM. And remember, up to that point, only me and Vidrin had basically done ultra high vacuum terrorists STM. So we really wanted to assemble kind of this super team. Okay, great. Similarly, Spencer has, at least for one semester, been funded through a Jerry Cowan um, scholarship. So, so basically everyone you see on this screen has been funded through the Jerry Cowan endowment. Okay, and then you can see, you know, the last picture was February. Within one month they had taken the first Terrets STM image of an atomically precise nanostructure. Great, so pretty good. Of course, you can see that was March 2020, so almost immediately Lee locked the doors and went home. <laughs> Luckily, we had this great data that we could analyze. So what was this thing they were looking at? Well, there's this new cool approach to, to building prospective electronics, which is you can start from a molecule, we call this molecular precursor, you evaporate it onto a surface, it has some sort of reactive bits that fall off. If you heat it up, it can, these things race around and find each other and they form a polymer chain and you heat it up a bit more and it forms a graphene nanoribbon. Now the cool thing is if I choose a different molecule I get a different graphene nanoribbon. So I could change this molecular precursor I call it and I could change the width of this ribbon or I could make it zigzag up and down and all sorts of things. So people are now really curious about what we might be able to use this from for where we grow some interesting nanostructure from the ground up from single molecules. So our goal is to bring in the optical side. So you can see here, this is our first paper. Yeah, I've just taken a, a, an example. Here's a terahertz STM image of a slice through this graphene nanoribbon. Because these are where the atoms are. And this is basically the electron distribution that's seen by terahertz STM. So that was nice as pretty soon as uh, even before we got our first paper out, we started getting some, some good um, response from this. So as Steve, uh, uh, Chair Professor Zepp said, <laughs> um, Spencer Ammerman won this uh, Best Student Presentation Award out of 2,000 entries at the IR Millimeter Wave Conference. Vidrin won this uh, poster award at this Herreo seminar. We briefly got to go to Germany while things were sort of feeling safe. And I won this Young Scientist Award. It's also led to some follow-up funding, I shouldn't say follow-up, funding from the Office of Naval Research and the Army Research Office. But one really key thing here is that what allowed us to really kickstart things and get set up really quickly and generate these results that led to getting this funding was actually having the Jerry Cowan endowed chair in the first place, right? Of course, everybody wants to fund it once it works. So, okay. So finally, I'll just mention one of these, these projects we're a part of, which is now this idea that's a, a collaborative research proposal involving some different universities where we're trying to now build these graphene nanoribbons into a prospective qubit, um, which would now sort of start to connect to what Jonas was telling us about. Okay, so finally, um, I just want to uh, highlight my group more broadly because I just mentioned a couple people so far. So I mentioned Spencer and Vidrin, who've done great work here at MSU. Mohammed Hassan and Sheng Li are the next generation of graduate students in my lab. They have already been around for a couple years. Their projects are in full swing, and they've really learned a lot. So it's very important to have this kind of knowledge transfer and have not just one good generation, but a stream of great generations of graduate students to, to keep these technical projects going. We have our newest 
team members, newest graduate student, Stephanie Adams, who we recruited away from a terahertz STM group in Germany. And we've got Trevor Hickel, another new graduate student, and Caden Cleland Host, who's an undergrad student working with us. During the setup phase especially, we also had a number of undergrad students, master's students who I'm highlighting here as some key contributors. So finally, we had you know, additional funding, but of course the purpose of this, I would like to thank the Cowan family for helping make this possible, especially Randy, and uh, thank you all for your attention. So thank you, Jonas and Tyler, for those outstanding and insightful presentations and describing some mind-blowing science and opportunities for the future. And now we have the greatest challenge of their short careers, and that is to be able to hold up these large medallions that Provost <laughs> Woodruff is going to, uh, to, to put on them. So with that, Provost Woodruff. Thank you, Provost Woodruff. That was incredibly well done. <laughs> so that uh, ends the formal part of our ceremony. Uh, and I know Val would like to take some uh, pictures, so she'll be. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> with with that, I'd like to invite Randy to say a few words. I just have a, a few uh, uh, short remarks and you know, uh, uh, thank everyone for the, the recognition of the, the chair and what it's been able to do. But I think really, um, you know, first I start with my dad's perspective. I mean, he always felt that um, having great faculty, having great graduate students and doing interesting research was really what it was all about. And um, I think he would be thrilled to see what has been created here in the last number of years. Uh, both with um, Dr. Cocker and, uh, and Dr. Becker, but also with Dr. Comstock and, and Dr. Powell and uh, before that. You know, it's really a core of people working in an area, a lot of it to do with quantum, but material sciences and, and a range of things that are similar to things my father would have worked on um, uh, years ago. Um, and just to see the vitality, the energy in the laboratories. I got a chance to spend about 45 minutes in each of the four labs today and just the uh, um, you know, the, the quality and, and the interesting research that's being done, the dy dynamism of the, of the professors, but also the graduate students is, is fabulous. And I think my father would be thrilled to see that that's a part of a legacy that, that uh, he has, you know, brought here to, um, to Michigan State. And so I think that's the first thing I'd like to say. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the second thing was just an, an observation that I think was, was interesting to me. I, I remember when I would go uh, with Jerry, you know, as a, I guess probably in the, when I was in elementary school and you sit there on the weekend when I wasn't in school and help him do experiments and, you know, you'd pour the liquid nitrogen out of the, the beaker into the equipment, you'd put the, the crystal in, you'd take some measurements, he'd whip out his slide rule and do some calculations <laughs> <laughs> to try to interpret the data. Um, and today, just the level of automation and technology involved in every bit of this, I mean, uh, as someone who spent uh, 40 years in the software industry, I certainly know how software has changed the world in, in many, many ways. But to see that in the, in the laboratories is, is, is fascinating and, you know, the range of, you know, packages, open source software, homegrown Python code uh, across all of them. It's just the world has changed dramatically in terms of the importance in, uh, of technology in every bit of the research we do, whether it's in controlling all the devices and the complexity of controlling all of that or whether it's in just analyzing huge amounts of data and being able to make sense of it in a way that you can't really do with a piece of paper and a slide rule anymore. 
So that was just a fascinating observation. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, a credit to the university for helping to ground undergrad and graduate students in the level of technology skills that they need to actually be able to contribute and do what needs to be done in this, um, uh, in this world is, uh, is great. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm thrilled that we were able to, uh, you know, fund this here at Michigan State in my dad's honor that the, the impact that the uh, two previous uh, Cowan chairs and the two current have had and will continue to have on this university on the physics department, I think, you know, is fabulous. And I think we're thrilled to see that as a, as a legacy of, uh, of my father here. Um, and uh, just to continue also to see the way things uh, change as well has been important. And, and for those of you, obviously, this is not a room full of donors, so someday I'll probably have to say it uh, to, <laughs> to a room full of donors, but uh, hearing the way in which um, the, the Cowan chairs were able to take the funds that they had and use it to do things. They, they didn't have to go to the department chair and try to scrape funds. They didn't have to win their first uh, DOD or NSF grant to be able to fund it. They could just go try to do something you know, different, interesting, hire an extra graduate student and just do it because they had the money available makes such a difference in their ability to do the science that they are doing in these laboratories and need to do in these laboratories. And um, I think that, you know, is a, is, a, is a message to sort of others who are at the point where they want to consider it. It's, it's just hugely impactful. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, yes, having a, an endowed chair matters, but just hearing that it was all about being able to do interesting research, not necessarily, you know, not necessarily having the, the title, although that can matter, but also having the free funds to try something experimental, to do something different, to hire one more grad student without going through a whole lot of process and just how impactful that is, um, you know, was a, was a wonderful thing to, to see. And hopefully it will be part of, um, I guess one of the things over many, many years I always liked about this country that I felt isn't quite as true today as it was in the early days of my father's research um, but just the, the, the emphasis on sheer basic research that someday will make the world a better place but doesn't have to pay off in five years. It doesn't have to pay off in 10 years. Maybe it will, and that would be wonderful, but it doesn't have to, uh, has always been a part of what made this country great. And somehow, in, I feel along the way a little bit, the focus has gotten to be much more about you know, how does this turn into a device in three years or an IPO in five years and not quite enough into uh, and spending the money we need to spend in, in fundamental scientific research and to, again to see the energy in the labs and the enjoyment in, in, in researchers and professors' eyes about just being able to go after, you know, a science problem and solve it um, was, you know, inspiring to me and, and reassuring for what the future of uh, our country is going to be. So uh, thank you very much, all of you, for, for the time here, for everything uh, you've done. and. Um, for the inspiration I took out of visiting your labs. So, thank you. Thanks, Randy. And uh, one thing that I observed from the first two uh, talks and, and from what Randy just described is the fact that, uh, that Jerry was a really great mentor. He loved mentoring students and bringing them along and encouraging them. And it was wonderful to see that Jonas and, and Tyler are already fully engaged in that activity and you'll be producing great scientists of the future. And uh, to reassure you, Randy, the, um, the College of Natural Science really focuses first on basic science. And so <laughs> most of our grants are really fully basic. And then, as you say, if there are opportunities to spin off applications, we will certainly do it, but basic science first. So with that, it really is the end of the formal part. <laughs> So thank you, Randy. Thank you, everybody. Um, to continue the celebration, we invite you to join us for a dessert reception in the Jackson Lounge right next door. And thank you for being here. <clears throat>
Yeah, I was supposed to start in July.